to order. Is this ready, Dave? Oh, wait, we have a solution. Should we wait for a solution? I can delay this by a minute. I'm not able to get on on my own device, so. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'll just go ahead and start this thing. Are we ready? Go. Should we start line dancing? Not ready for that yet. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Scott. All right, I'm going to call to order the special closed session meeting. Please call the roll. Right. Councilmember Bowders. Here. Councilmember Donahue. Here. Councilmember Martinez. Here. Vice Mayor Patz. Here. And Mayor Medina. Here. Um, any ex parte communications to report? I believe we all got an email from SEIU 1021. That's right. Yes. Uh, Anything else? I didn't see that email. Was it late? It was yesterday. From Maru? <laughs> should have seen it. I didn't At least four of us got the email. Okay, but I did wave to Marcy out front a few minutes ago. I don't know if that meets the qualification of an ex parte. <laughs> um, but thank you I for your cooperation. <laughs> all right. Me. Anything else? No? All right. Any public comment on closed session items? Settle down, everyone. Um, all right. Let's go into closed session. Report out of closed session. Thank you, Mayor. The Emeryville City Council, uh, the Mesa Board, uh, and the successor agency met in closed session on the items listed on the closed session agenda. Regarding item 5.1.1, an update was provided and direction was given. Uh, regarding item 6.1.1, an update was provided and direction given. Regarding item 6.1.2, and 6.1.3, an update was provided uh, for all of the items under 6.2, an update was provided. All of the items under 6.3, all of the, uh, an update was provided. And uh, item 7.1.1, an update was provided. Thank you. Thank you. This meeting is adjourned. The next meeting starts at 7.15 p.m. We have a three-minute break. to the Emeryville Redevelopment Agency. It's the blue agenda before we get to the main one. Please call the roll. Councilmember Bowders. Here. Councilmember Donahue. Here. Councilmember Martinez. Here. Vice Mayor Patz. Here. And Mayor Medina. Here. Can I get approval of the final agenda? So moved. Seconded. We've got a uh, motion by Member Martinez and a second by myself. Councilmember Bowders? Aye. Councilmember Donahue? Aye. Councilmember Martinez? Aye. Vice Mayor Patz? Aye. And Mayor Medina? Aye. All right, any ex parte communications to report? No, Mayor. None for me. Any public comment for consent agenda items or items not on this agenda? Is this a regular meeting? No. no. Successor agency. Oh, I'm sorry. Cool. All right, seeing none, uh, we've got the consent calendar. So moved. Move approval of the consent calendar. All right. I heard a motion from Member Martinez. Is that a second I heard it's from Member Donahue? Yes. Perfect. Please call the roll. Councilmember Bowders? Aye. Councilmember Donahue? Aye. Councilmember Martinez? Aye. Vice Mayor Patz? Aye. And Mayor Medina? Aye. All right. This meeting is adjourned at 7.16 p.m. It is 7.16 p.m. and I'm calling to order the City Council meeting of the City of Emeryville. We are all still present. I don't think we need to call the roll. Great. Um, I would like, is there an approval of the final agenda? I might want to move up a single item on it, actually. Give me just a second. Where was the curb one? It's 12.4. Yeah, I would like to move up 12.4 to be heard um, after 12.1. Um, that's my motion for this agenda. Is that okay with everyone? Can I get a second? Second. A motion by myself um, for the agenda, but with 12.4 moved up to after 12.1. And a second by Member Bowders. Council Member Bowders? Aye. Council Member Donahue? Aye. Council Member Martinez? Aye. Vice Mayor Potts? Aye. And Mayor Medina? Aye. All right, uh, special orders of the day. 
Madam Mayor, we have two. Great. Charlie? Uh, yes, Mayor Medina, members of the City Council, I would like to call up uh, Economic Development and Housing Manager Chad Smalley, who will introduce our newest staff member. Yes, good evening, Mayor, members of City Council, Chad Smalley, Economic Development and Housing Manager. It gives me great pleasure to introduce to you uh, today uh, Valerie Bernardo, our newest Community and Economic Development Coordinator too, working on affordable housing issues. Valerie comes to us with a wealth of experience, 15 years uh, plus of affordable housing experience. She's worked for the University Community Development Corporation. She's worked for the County of DeKalb, uh, Georgia's Housing Authority as a real estate manager. She was a housing development manager and then ultimately the Director of Housing and Community Development for the City of Atlanta, Georgia. So she comes to us knowing uh, a wealth of information about affordable housing and is ready to deploy that knowledge here in the city of Emeryville. So I'd like to introduce you to Valerie. Hi, good evening, council members. Valerie Bernardo. I'm very excited to be here. Um, actually, I'm originally from the Bay Area, grew up in Pleasant Hill and left after to go away to college and very excited to return back to my home roots and work here in Emeryville and be a part of the growth and the redevelopment of this community. Very excited to have you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. I'm pleased to introduce to you our new accounting technician, Andre Ariaga. Andre will be responsible for the city's accounts receivable and revenue collection. Um, before joining us, Andre was the accounts receivable technician for the city of El Cerrito for three and a half years. She managed El Cerrito's business license program and was responsible for revenue collection. Prior to the city of El Cerrito, she was a staff accountant for nonprofit organizations in, in Richmond for about two years. Before that, she worked for Walgreens for 11 years and was promoted to um, assistant store manager. Please join me in welcoming Andrea to the Emerald family. Good evening, City Council. Uh, thank you. F I just want to say thank you for this opportunity, and I'm excited to be here. And um, I'm just really excited to make some new changes. And thank you for welcoming me here to the city of Emeryville. Good welcome. Any announcement of commission or committee vacancies? Just the same announcement I made last time, which is that we have a few remaining vacancies after the annual appointments. Your applications for those are due on August 12th, and the appointments will be made by the council at its September 3rd meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Any council member special announcements or reports on meetings attended? Um, I would just like to thank the Community Services Department for um, the dive-in movie, which was Lilo and Stitch. I was Lilo. You all missed it. Um, but it was a very well-attended event and um, went very smoothly. Fantastic. Anything else? Okay. Thank you so much. City Manager's report. This is our last meeting of the legislative session. We will not be back till September 3rd, so I just want to remind everybody of the Rotten City Block Party on August 24th. Thank you. <laughs> Please come. We will also have a rottenness dog contest where we will be embracing those dogs that maybe wouldn't win one of those fancy dog shows, but we will love these dogs. And every dog will get a little doggy bag, I believe. <laughs> Sherry's arranging everything. It's going to be a phenomenal time. Um, I am not judging the stinkiest breath portion. I'm just going to say that right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any ex parte communications to report? Yes. Uh, Madam Mayor, I met with um, SEIU 10 to 1, Unite here in Alameda Labor Council concerning item 12.1. I did the same. Um, the same on item 12.1 to the extent I uh, met with several members of the Labor Council. Also met with uh, roughly a dozen restaurants and workers um, here in the city. And on 11.2, I had a meeting with um, Ronnie Hatrip, Betsy Cooley, Bobby Lee, and Jeff Sears, who are the director and three board members for the Emeryville Transportation Management Authority. Thank you. Any other ex parte? Phone call with uh, labor organiza organization. Okay. 
Thank you. All right, any public comment for consent agenda items or items not on this agenda? I'll note that if you intend to give public comment, there are cards you can fill out in advance so I can start getting you in line for it. Where are the cards? I will put those down there so they're publicly available, available and you can pass them up so I'll have them in advance and can call on you. Um, so for now, anything for the consent agenda or items not on the consent agenda? A lot of purple over there. Um, <clears throat> okay, as Emeryville tonight and moving forward, as the city hall moves to quickly repeal our uh, various uh, regulations to accommodate the ANI project, <clears throat> several of them we're going to be repealing one tonight and then more moving forward. It's, it's always a good time like times like this are always good to reflect like where we have been in the recent past and so in the spirit of that i give you citizen john bowders before he was on the city council this was a little i have a little snippet of a recording Do you remember i told you it wasn't going to be always you diane i was going to move on to uh, your colleagues so now it's john's turn in the hot seat so um mr bowders was not on the council yet but the council had just attempted to do an, a building moratorium for new development because there was a lot of concern that we weren't getting family housing. And, and private citizen Bowders came up to this microphone and told the council that uh, even though the moratorium didn't uh, succeed, he says that we should uh, make sure that we get city, uh, you have uh, your family housing, housing mix regulations and we can f say no to developers that, that don't do what we want them to do. So this is, what Council Member Bowders said in um, 2015 when he was a private citizen. The final decision to approve a lot of the things they ask for. And so you can choose to deny these projects if they don't listen to what's been said today and they don't deliver on the things that come out. Um, and you should deny them because everything that they question about your integrity here coming into this meeting um, should be questioned going forward as to their statements today, the veracity of what they claim they're going to do. Okay, so you, he, he told, he told the, the four of you that you should deny developers who don't uh, follow by our, unit, our unit, family housing unit mix regulations. So just remember that moving forward, uh, when, when Ani asks you to repeal our unit, unit mix, family housing unit mix regulations, mm -hmm. remember your colleague, Mr. Bowder has told you to deny that. So, so that means we have, that means Ani has to play ball and provide the family housing that, that, uh, that, that we say they should. You're, that's from your colleague, John Bowders. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Carpio. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is André Carpio, and I'm looking at the Army uh, project as another Goliath in the, in the area. And so in looking at the city map, at the junction of the city of, of Oakland and, and Emeryville, it, it goes into uh, some kind of arrow in a bay. And I think that uh, that area would be a good place to build the army. And, uh, and we, we also have to, to build the army with, with an angle that will be compatible with the average solar uh, area so that we do not put in a shade anything that's in the land. In other words, if we have the army building in planted in, the middle, in, in that part of the bay there. If there is an earthquake and the army fall down the water, well, that's the developer's problem. But uh, if the army fall down where there is an area, people in the area, then other people will be um, crushed, maybe, and so. So uh, I think the location of the army should be uh, directed to be in that part of the bay 
and then we can always connect it and have the Bach station going from North Berkeley under that part and we join West Auckland. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment for the consent agenda or items not on the agenda? Okay, seeing none, we have a motion for the consent. Okay, do we have a motion for the consent agenda? So moved. Second. All right, we've got a motion from Member Bowders and a second from Vice Mayor Pats. Please call the roll. Council Member Bowders? Aye. Council Member Donahue? Aye. Council Member Martinez? Aye. Vice Mayor Pats? Aye. And Mayor Medina? Aye. Okay. Let's move on. Public hearings. 11.1, we've got a resolution of the City Council of the City of Emeryville granting a waiver from the noise ordinance to EH Housing and JH Fitzmaurice for Saturday and Sunday work from August 14, 2019 to October 30, 2019 between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. Good evening, Mayor. Good evening, Council. Uh, as you said, this is for a noise waiver proposed for the Stereo Vista project at 3706 San Pablo Avenue. So back in January of 2015, the Planning Commission approved this 87-unit affordable housing development. And in 2019, uh, original contract completion date uh, was scheduled for this project. In August of 2019, coming up, the contract completion date was extended due to unforeseen conditions. As a result of that, back in February, the applicant came um, to the city council for a noise waiver for Saturday work, which was granted. Um, several complaints were received from a neighbor on Linden Street since that time, and the contractor has abided by the conditions of approval and attempted to address the concerns. Work has not been stopped as conditions have not been violated. So the request tonight, the general contractor is now requesting for an extension of the noise waiver through October 30th, 2019. In order to complete the work, Sunday work is also requested from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Work is not anticipated to occur every Saturday or Sunday, rather two to three Saturdays per month and select Sundays as needed. So they need some flexibility to um, accommodate the contracting work that needs to be done. This request is very similar to the previous request that was granted in terms of the work that's being done. So the proposed exterior work is lath and stucco and paint, waterproofing and pavers. Uh, there's been some addition of painting and thin brick installation. That was not on the previous request, I don't think. Um, and this would be on San Pablo, West MacArthur and 37th Street. The proposed interior work is for drywall, taping, texturing, painting and finishing work. And site work would include landscaping and more concrete and paver work. So here's the location of the work. MacArthur's at the top of the screen, 37th at the bottom. San Pablo's to the left. So a notification was mailed for this and legal advertisement as required. So staff believes the request for work is reasonable given the nature of the work and staff notes that the work will not be taking place every Saturday and Sunday. To minimize the impact, staff believes that Sunday work should be limited to the interior and courtyard areas only using hand tools and mixers to minimize impacts to the neighbors and no work on Labor Day weekend. So those uh, two items, the limitations on Sunday work and no work on Labor Day are in included in the conditions of approval for this project. Oh, sorry, there we go. So the applicant is here if you have any questions or need more details about the work that's being done. Thank you. Any clarifying questions? Okay, we're gonna open this public hearing at 731. Does anyone want to comment on this item? Yeah, Emeryville's noise ordinance waiver is uh, sometimes referred to as Emeryville's weakest law. Um, <coughs> but we've had it for, I believe, since 2008, I believe, and only three times since 2008 out of the, I've lost count of how many requests, there have been only three denials over that entire time. Uh, so the, the ratio is just staggering. I, I mean, I think personally we should get rid of the noise ordinance waiver because it's just routinely granted. I think two of the three times were citizens, I, I believe, uh, not corporations asking for noise ordinance waivers. Uh, I just think we should, any law that is not enforced, like the noise ordinance, 
or that just get waivers are gr granted carte blanche or just you know without question like this this law in Emeryville is I, I just think we should s just expunge it from the books clearly the city council doesn't want to have a noise ordinance waiver and it's you guys are allowed to uh, take it off our books and uh, it just causes a lot of people to come up here these developers have to come here and ask and hat in hand and they don't just waste their time and it wastes everybody's time I just think you should get rid of the ordinance because you know you just don't enforce it and so since you don't enforce it just get rid of the ordinance that's what I suggest thank you any other public comment on this item all right seeing none the public hearing is closed at 733 any discussion Member Donahue. I'm surprised no neighbors are here. Just an observation. It's all interior work. It's interior work. Well, they specified some exterior work. Does anyone want to make a motion? I'll move the resolution. Second. All right, we've got a motion by Member Martinez. We've got a second by Member Batters. Please call the roll. Councilmember Bowders. Aye. Councilmember Donahue. Aye. Councilmember Martinez. Aye. Vice Mayor Pats. Aye. And Mayor Medina. Aye. <coughs> All right. 11.2 PBIT assessment and ETMA budget. Build some affordable housing. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. For your consideration tonight is a resolution establishing the fiscal year 2019-20 PBIT assessment levy. The city is responsible for collecting the PBIT assessments. Uh, staff recommends that the city council approve the 5% levy increase um, and the ETMA's preliminary budget for service year 2020. Ronnie from uh, ETMA will give a presentation regarding the budget and why a 5% increase it's recommended. Now I will turn it over to Ronnie. Thank you, Susan, and good evening, Mayor and Council Members. I'm Ronnie Hatchup with the Executive Director of the Emeryville Transportation Management Association. And I'd like to just give um, a brief overview of our preliminary budget for 2020 and also provide you with a status update on our bus yard project, um, which is currently underway. So with that, we'll just proceed. I apologize for the, the small screen font, but uh, before you is the proposed budget for, um, preliminary budget for the ETMA uh, for 2019. On the top portion, you can see the uh, various revenue projection options, uh, the first column being zero, Percent, the second being three and the, and the third being 5%. Um, below that, in the table below, you can see our 2020 proposed um, expenditures. Um, most of our expenditures are, are generally standard. The one key item that I, was, I would like to point out is the site development uh, long-term bus yard item of $2.2 million. Uh, that is one expense that is um, uh, just a, a special expense this year, uh, next year that we anticipate. And I'll go just more in detail on that uh, and further on the slideshow here. Um, this is our cash balance summary. So as of January 1st of this year, we had about $2.6 million in our, in our cash account. Now this is just Emeryville TMA's account. Um, we anticipate that we will have a budget overrun of $820,000, and that is for the initiation of the construction, which we anticipate will occur this fall, um, as well as our soft costs, the, the engineering um, and site development um, um, efforts. Um, our projected cash balance on 20, I'm sorry, December 31st of 2019 is 1.7, and you can see the projected shortfall for 2020 with a 5% increase is um, went just over a million dollars, leaving us with a, cash, a projected cash balance of um, $700,000. So why 5%? Um, as I've mentioned, we have a bus yard. We do have, um, and we anticipate higher construction costs than we originally thought. Um, we know that 
when we established the PBID, we had a goal to have a 3% increase per year, but we do know that our costs historically have trended at 5% per year or more. As a matter of fact, in the prior PBID, it was closer to 6.5%. So our costs have always trended at a, at a higher rate, um, but we had known that we had built up our reserves early on in the PBID so that we can carry ourselves through the later years, um, maintaining a 3% increase. Um, we also have to maintain a 15% off rating reserve per our TMA policies. And just to give you a sense of what that is, it's about two months operating expenses for the Amigo round. So just here's a brief uh, chart of kind of our, our historical um, annual PBIT increase uh, per year trend. So you can see we had the base year that we had 5%, 5% when the economy downturned, we had uh, 0%. Um, then we had the five and five, and then we dropped it down in uh, the latter part of the year, um, in the latter part of the, the, the prior PBIT cycle to 2.5% per year. Um, in 2015-16, it was renewed, and since then, we've had a 3% increase uh, per year, and, and this year, we're asking for 5%. Uh, here's just a, a, a history of our cost trends going back to 2006, and you can see we're kind of all over the map. The map. Some of this is because we have high capital equipment purchases in certain years. Um, in 2013, we, we, had a new P, we had a new operations contract, which brought our operations cost down significantly. And in 2016, we increased our operations um, service plan by 15%. So you can see that increase there in 2016. We've also had to deal with competitive operator wages. So we've had to increase, modify our contracts um, in 2016-17 to um, keep our drivers, <laughs> essentially. So the status update, update on the Mandela bus yard, um, we did receive Oakland approval from, from the Oakland Planning Commission on our major conditional use, conditional use permit in April. Um, our design and environmental package was just recently submitted to Caltrans last month. Uh, we are in the process of developing our lease comments and our target date for the Emeryville TMA approval is next month at August 15th. And our target date for the lease approval by the California Transportation Commission is October 2019. Um, we anticipate construction completion in June of 2020. So <clears throat> this is more up-to-date information. So we just received, as part of our package submittal to Caltrans, we received an engineer's estimate for our construction project, which came to $2.9 million. Um, this was over a million dollars more than we originally thought it was going to be. So. Uh, we've talked to our engineer, and we understand the bidding climate is rather aggressive right now, so uh, costs are higher, and um, we've also en uh, encumbered some soft costs to date for our design contracts, and um, our total anticipated project cost right now is about, about $3.3 million. Um, ETMA had only designated $1 million in our cash reserve for the bus yard project. Um, in the budget, you would also probably notice that we had a $1 million uh, city, I think, CIP budget item for another million. So we, we were kind of targeting the two million range, now we're up to 3.3. Um, so in 2019 and 2020, um, I should note, the engineer's estimate includes a 20% contingency, and that's a little bit high. So we, we budgeted 2.7. We budgeted just a little bit lower than the 2.9 than the 2 million um, construction estimate. We will know what that estimate, we will know what the true number is when we when we have the bids in, in the fall. So by the time we come back to you with our final budget, we will have more defined uh, bus yard costs. Um, I think that's that. And okay, so this, hopefully you can read this. Uh, we have three scenarios that we've provided here just to kind of give you an idea of where we are with, given the fact that we are going to use our utilize our cash balance at a higher rate, um, it, it has a long-term impact to how we can maintain uh, the service at the current level of service. And um, if, if you can see on the chart up here, we anticipate, because we're using the, so, so much of our reserves, that we're going to run out of money in 2025. Our deficit starts then and just carries on through. Um, so this is the scenario where we have a 3% increase in the PBID per year, and uh, the operations uh, set at a 5% annual increase. Scenario two looks at a 4% model. And you can see that carries us a little bit further, but running into a deficit in 2028 uh, before the end of the PBID. And then scenario three provides you with a 5% uh, scenario through the end of the PBID. You can see we, we, that would leave us with a very healthy balance um, at the end of the year. So 
with that, I want to share just the variables and risks that we have. We have high, high construction bids on our bus yard. We have um, some of the variables are the rate at which our, in, our, our, our expenses increase. So if we spend more uh, earlier or spend less you know, earlier, it really has an impact on how that will carry us through. So uh, that's a big unknown. We um, are always in anticipation of operator wage changes, and so we'd like to keep ourselves in a good position there. Uh, our operators are very important to our service. And uh, we also know that we will potentially need to secure new, um, a new contract for security personnel for our new bus yard site. Uh, we've made no decisions yet, but that's a possibility in the future, and that's not uh, factored into our current budget right now. We're going to kind of see how we are when we get the bus yard going, see if we have any issues, and then make that determination at a later time. Um, one thing, one clarification I wanted to point out, I think I noticed in the staff report there was a a comment about 5% for five years. Um, because there are too many variables right now, I don't think the TMA board is not making a commitment to five years of 5%. I think this year is just a recommendation to increase at 5% for only 2020, and we'll, we'll, we will make recommendations on later increases on a year-by-year -year basis as we see where our costs fall and, um, yeah, how things are going, how our, how our forecast is looking. So I believe I covered everything. If I haven't, I'm here to answer any questions. Any clarifying yeah. questions? Thank you for providing us a printout of the, as well. It was very much easier to read. Good. Yeah. Great. Appreciate that. Thanks. Okay. Going to go ahead and open up this public hearing at 744. Just a comment on this item. Betsy Pooley, resident and um, board member of the ETMA. Um, and I'm here to support the budget and five for the budget request and the 5% um, assessment increase request. And um, we had discussed both of these at length at the last ETMA board meeting and with all of the, the residential members and with the um, business members. And I think we all agreed that given all the circumstances, given the bus yard and, and different things that 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 was a reasonable request. Um, and then, because Council Member uh, Bowders is on the um, Budget Committee and Transportation Committee, we did um, just Sears and um, Bobby Lee and Ronnie and I uh, met with him. Oh, I'm sorry. We met with him and went over the assessment and the um, budget um, in detail. And we think that it's um, appropriate and would, so would recommend that you approve it. And so if you have any questions, let me know. Thank you. Hi, good evening. Uh, I'm Bobby Lee, residential member on the e ETMA. Uh, as you heard tonight from Ronnie, uh, the cost of running a comprehensive first and last mile transportation solution for Emeryville residents, workers, and visitors it has risen. This is obviously combated by the cost of our new bus yard, as Ronnie mentioned, and, and many other things. Um, as a representative of residential assessment payers, it's important for me to ensure that every dollar we're spending is efficiently used and ensure that we're only asking for as much of an assessment increase as is truly needed. Um, after reviewing the financial statements and the state of our bus yard project, I believe the most fiscally prudent action for us to take is to request this council to approve a 5% increase in the coming uh, year's PBID assessment. And I uh, urge you to support and approve this request uh, for an increase. It's not a decision that I take lightly, especially given the cost of living and other expenses we all face day to day, but providing a superior first and last mile transportation solution is our job number one. Uh, whether you're one of the 1.5 million people that ride the Emory go around every year or not, every individual here in Emeryville uh, benefits from this service and we must keep this valuable service going for years to come by funding the ETMA at a sustainable level. Uh, thank you for your continu continued support and uh, again I urge your approval of this uh, PBIT increase. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment on this item? Okay. Seeing none, the public hearing is closed at 7.46 p.m. I'll open this up for discussion. I'll kick it off with Council Member Batters since you've been involved in these discussions. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I just want to thank uh, Ronnie and Betsy and Bobby for all coming out and all the members of the TMA board for all your work during the year. Um, I do strongly support the recommended 5% increase. Um, I've had a chance to review this budget in great detail with the TMA's board. Um, 
I'm not going to repeat all the things that were said, the reasons why. I just want to highlight a few things. I want to thank the council and the city staff. Um, this point last year, um, council authorized me to work with the TMA and the staff to collect uncollected direct bill payments. We had hundreds of thousands of dollars of uncollected fees. Um, and we uh, negotiated a settlement with the school district to repay all their fees. We um, have captured all the money that was due and owing for years to the TMA, and that has, um, in light of that, we still are looking at a 5% increase. And I think uh, I get a lot of inquiries from residents um, about uh, the conditions of the fleet, and I just want to, since we have the opportunity to discuss this briefly, just uh, let everyone know the TMA has a very good um, and comprehensive plan for um, prudently rolling out improvements to the TMA, uh, to the Emory Go Round service. Uh, free transit is one of the most important things to making a community equitable, and um, I have been very vocal about that for a long time. Um, I think it's important for us to approve this 5% increase with the yard lease being signed hopefully in the next couple months, um, and albeit somewhat expensive improvements necessary to make the yard uh, usable, the hope I have after that is um, working with the TMA to um, install, we're going to build it out so that it has got the capacity to have electric vehicles in the future with the goal being that we will get grants in the future um, from the respective uh, clean air and transit agencies in the Bay Area to um, have a, hopefully a completely green fleet in the future, which is um, going to do a lot of good for us. So for all those reasons and for all the good work you do, I want to thank you all for your work. and. Um, I will, uh, I'll go ahead and make a motion even though there's still discussion. I'll move to approve. Thank you. Any other comments? I'll just second it. Okay. I think that this is a phenomenal service that enriches the lives of Emeryville citizens. It's part of our multimodal transit and I'm very much looking forward um, to continuing to ride the Emory go round for years to come and making it even better. So um, we've got a motion second. Please call the roll. Councilmember Bowders? Aye. Councilmember Donahue? Aye. Councilmember Martinez? Aye. Vice Mayor Patz? Aye. And Mayor Medina? Aye. Okay. All right, this brings us up to item 12.1. Um, council action to either repeal the ordinance um, 19007 in its entirety or place a measure on the ballot for the November election. I'd like to ask our city manager to walk us through exactly what this means before we start. Yes, Madam Mayor. So um, just to recall uh, the history of this item. So on May 29th, the council adopted the second reading of an amendment to the minimum wage ordinance um, that created a new definition and a new uh, wage rate increase for a subset of businesses in Emeryville um, that um, that ordinance was then referended um, by way of a signature gathering effort. Um, sufficient signatures were then submitted to the city clerk and ultimately to the registrar of voters. The registrar of voters confirmed that there were 871, I believe, um, confirmed signat uh, signatures of Emeryville registered voters, which was sufficient to then referend that ordinance and what that means is the ordinance was then suspended as of July 9th when the certificate, when the resolution was approved by the council um, accepting that certification. Under the terms of the elections code, the council now has two choices um, in terms of what to do next. So the amendment is suspended, which means that the minimum wage in Emeryville currently is $16.30 for all employers. The council has two choices, which is to rescind that amendment to the minimum wage ordinance in its entirety, or to place it on the ballot for the voters to consider the referendum petition. The next general municipal election is choice is a choice, which would be November of 2020, or the council can call a special election. That special election can occur no less than 88 days from July 9th, mm -hmm. when the cert Correct. certification was approved, accepted by resolution. So again, two choices, rescind the ordinance in its entirety or place the matter on the ballot at the next general election in November of 2020 or at a special election. Thank you. Are there any clarifying questions about the process here? 
Okay, great. I'm going to open it up for public comment on this item. I've only got one card. That doesn't mean other people can't speak. I'll start off with Douglas Smith. Good evening, Mayor Medina, City Council members. Um, I'm Doug Smith from Rudy's Canfield Cafe. Um, I'd like to take a moment to thank Councilman John Bowders for meeting with members of the independent restaurant and community here in Emeryville. Um, having members of the City Council listen to our concerns about managing our businesses in Emeryville is very welcomed. Uh, it's crucial to have discussions continuing about how the city can assist small business to remain sustainable in Emeryville. A group discussion needs to be centered around how to make future minimum wage increases less challenging for small businesses and to help keep us here in Emeryville. Uh, additional rebate programs to assist small businesses would be welcomed. Um, like many restaurants here in Emeryville, our goal is to stay in business and continue to provide employment to our staff. Um, I just wanted to say that I appreciate the time and effort that's been taken by the City Council to look at this. Um, we by no means want to make any rash decisions, but we now have to evaluate what the minimum wage increase will do to our financial situation, as all businesses in Emeryville are going to be doing. So I just want to take a moment to step back and say thank you for taking our concerns seriously and looking forward to the future of having discussions to continue talking about it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment on this item? Ruth Major, good evening. Um, I think the residents have spoken and said that they want this to continue and for the workers to have their raise. Um, I do think we do need to do something for our small businesses, and I mean small businesses, not, um, not restaurants with 19 locations and possibly 20 um, globally. So if we can find ways to, to make it work for our small business people, um, I think that would be great. And I think there are many ways, and I know you've been looking at them and, and working on them. So I hope you will um, do the right thing tonight. Thank you. Betsy Cooley, uh, resident. Uh, with due respect to, uh, to Ruth, who I very much respect, um, I just think that um, I know a lot of people signed that um, referendum. Um, but I also know that the um, union, the SEIU, and the working East Bay families, or I'm not sure exactly what the name of the group was, sent out two very large flyers about this. And they just, uh, the only information basically was that it was we were rolling back the min minimum wage. And I think that this was a much more nuanced uh, situation. And I think that the impact on the small resident, the small um, <coughs> Businesses, restaurants particularly, um, has had the largest impact because of the um, the fact that they have to pay the minimum wage in addition to the tips, and um, and that that puts pressure on the wages for the entire um, organ, the, the entire restaurant, all of the other employees, and. Um, I think that when they separated out the tips from the minimum wage, they weren't anticipating that it was going to go up to sixteen dollars and thirty cents in such a short period of time. Um, so I don't know what the answer is. I mean, I think something should be done to give some relief to um, the restaurants. And the, the other thing is, I think that because when I've heard from the unions and other people talk about it, they always talked about it in terms of, um, oh, this is a the city council wants to roll back the minimum wage. When in reality, it's a very small carve out, and the union just doesn't want any carve outs. And um, I just don't think that I think that. Emeryville has been very supportive of the unions and Fair Work Week, and you know we have the highest um, minimum wage in the country, maybe the world at this point. And I think that forcing us to really sort of do everything that they want or trying to force us to, I don't think that people who signed the referendum necessarily knew, understood all of the um, details of you know what was um, involved in this. And anyway. So I don't know what you should do, but I think that some um, you should make some effort to make things um, whole with the small restaurants. Thank you. Okay. Any additional public comment on this item?
Hello, I'm Judith Epstein. Today in Emeryville, the minimum wage is $16.30. If you were to place the referendum on the ballot, you'd be asking the voters to lower the minimum wage for restaurant, certain restaurant employees. In fact, your ballot question would have to truthfully read, should an ordinance be passed to lower the minimum wage of people who work in small independent restaurants and reduce their cost of living increased until 2027? I urge you not to follow such an unfair and misguided approach, but rather rescind the ordinance tonight. Find another path. Um, at the end of the discussion at the last meeting, Mayor Medina, you said that a resolution was in the works and you gave no clue as to what it might be. I hope you can find another way. If you want to work with small businesses that are struggling, find a tax break, a rebate, find something, but don't ask the workers to pay because they're the people who they work the hardest and they get the least. Find another way. I like how sanctimonious uh, the businesses are when they come before you when they want something out of you. They're here, they'll tell you <clears throat> to help Emeryville citizens. They want to help. And what they won't say is they want to make a profit. <laughs> I'm 60 years old. I've never met any business owners that aren't interested in making a profit. It's, a, it's a insulting. They're here to make a profit. There's nothing wrong with that. But that's, I mean, let's not fool ourselves. I, I, it's so tiresome, the, the sanctimony. And then you need to remember why the five of you are here. You're here for us, the residents. The business owners in Emeryville don't count. They literally don't count. They can't vote unless if they happen to also live here, which are, I guess there might be a few. Actually, I'm one. Um, but, the, but in general, the, the people that matter in Emeryville are the people that live here, the residents. So uh, we're, we're not supposed to be working for the small businesses. We're supposed to be allowing the small businesses to be here insofar as the Constitution says we have to. But on top of that, insofar as that we feel they can be helpful to us, then we should allow them to be or maybe even work with them but ha having them operate on the backs of like poor people that's not good enough and frankly this whole episode has been just shameful you know mr bowders you strolled into this town and essentially what you told us is you think that emeryville is too left wing and that you're here to to roll back our minimum wage the town is great you say except it's too liberal you want to use the word liberal uh, so I'm here, Mr. Bowder says, to make the town less liberal, less, less progressive, and I'm here to roll back the minimum wage. You know, I, I don't know why you did that. We, you know, it's, you've harmed our city's reputation as it being a progressive and forward-thinking city and, and a city that uh, was looking to help, you know, not be a locus of suffering uh, like it was previously. And I just think it's been a shameful period. And I don't know why you went down this path. I'm just, I'm just still baffled. I, I, Mr. Bowders personally, I think he's a really nice person, and, and it do, there, this doesn't seem like the kind of thing that you would do, and I still don't know why. And, and so I, I just urge you tonight here just to just you know, admit you, you, know, you made a mistake, All, you know, th those of you that f forwarded this, and just you know, stop it here tonight, and let's just move forward with, with what the people here want to have happen, and that is to have the Emeryville not be a locus of suffering. Thank you. I'm Marilyn Boucher. My husband and I own The Broken Rat. We're a small independent restaurant. Um, I want to echo what Doug said, that we were greatly appreciated in May when the city council actually listened to us, it seemed like, for perhaps the first time, uh, about how dire the situation is becoming for some of us. And uh, I'd love to make a profit. I didn't make a profit last year. I can't go that many years without making a profit. But believe me, my main gay goal is to stay in business, to keep the people who work for me working, and to keep the community that centers in our business uh, going. Um, people have talked about taking it out on the back of the lowest paid workers. 
uh, again, I just think you need to recognize that more than two-thirds of the minimum wage workers in my business are tipped employees, and they've been making more than 1630 since before the MWO was even passed. So these are not, front of the house people are not the <laughs> lowest earning people in our town. Also talking about helping residents, I have 27, 28 employees. I have one who lives in Emeryville, and he's a professional. It's, he's in a two-income household. He does it because he has a, he likes pool, and he gets to play pool when he's not working for it. So it's, you know, the MWO of 1630 isn't going to make it possible for people to live in Emeryville. I, so, and the other thing is looking at, it wasn't really lowering the wage for employees because nobody was going to take a tax cut. It was just going to stay where it was for one year. Uh, but it was an 8% increase in that category of expense for businesses. That's double what the actual CPI increase was, and that was double what it's been for the last few years. So the fact that we were facing an increase of over a dollar, a dollar thirty, was only because of the coincidence that this happened to be the year when the CPI spiked. And that's not something that was anticipated when the schedule was more or less arbitrarily laid out. So I continue to believe that um, most Emeryville residents would support this small carve out for independent restaurants. And um, I also appreciate the fact of talking about people who would like to see us supported in other ways. But I have to say again, the magnitude of the impact of this minimum wage increase, there's no way the city can duplicate that in other kinds of programs. So thank you very much. Any additional public comment on this item? All right. I'm going to open this up for discussion. Um, Vice Mayor Pats? I think I've made my opinions on this pretty clear. Um, I do want to thank people who come and talk. I, so I'm, I'm sort of a little shaken by something uh, Mr. Donahue said. You walk into the city of Emeryville, you walk into this room, you are our concern. I don't really like this idea that we divide people in any way, shape, or form. I don't care if you're a resident, I don't care if you're a business owner, I don't care if you're a visitor. You fall into the city's jurisdiction, we're here for you. I think my colleagues feel the same way. And the idea that we pass ordinances and laws, we apply to anybody who walks into our jurisdiction. And the only reason we limit it there is because that's where we are limited. But this idea that we group people and say, oh, it's for this group or for that group, I don't, I don't like framing things that way. That is a very dangerous and inappropriate way to frame things. Um, I do appreciate what small business had to say about the workers. I do hear you when you say two thirds are making more, but it is that one third. I have said all along, I thought this was a very thoughtful ordinance when it was first drafted. I think we were not shocked by the CPI as much as how much it's gone up, but for how long it continues to go up. And so when it was laid out to merge the two, the plan was to give it time. And our economy has just steamed forward. And so the CPI has been high for many years now. It's not all in this last year. It has been on this path for a long time. Where I do diverge is we are where we're supposed to be at 1630. And I don't know that the expense of going to the voters to change that is worthwhile. Member Donahue. here. I think uh, we should do the least harm. And this vote is different than the other vote, and the least harm now is to repeal. Member Martinez? Um, I don't have a lot to add to the comments that I've made um, at other meetings, uh, but I do want to just make note that um, we have a very special council uh, where we can disagree on very controversial issues. 
that are meaningful to the public, but I think at the heart of it, we all um, want very much want the same thing, um, which is you know uh, for people to be able to live in the Bay Area on a job, on one full-time job. Um, so I just want to thank my colleagues for wherever we come out on this issue for um, working collegially, and I, I, if we can come out of this um, still talking to each other at the end of the night, then I, I think we could tackle any issue. So I just want to thank you all. Member Batters. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I want to begin by thanking a few people. I want to thank all the employees and employers in Emeryville who have um, spoken to me about this issue. And I have remained largely silent since we first introduced this in May, mostly out of respect to them um, and the opportunity to listen to people about what this means to them. And, um, you know, I'm kind of heart sick. I'm heart sick because there's a lot of things I would like to share about the real life situations of people who will be impacted by the choice one way or the other. Um, and it would be imprudent for me to share some of those things. Um, there are a lot of minority owned businesses in this town. Um, there are a lot of people who are undocumented who work at these businesses. Um, and I think the only thing I lament about this process is that the stakeholders who speak the loudest are often the most uncivil and that we could not have a discourse that allowed us to illuminate the fact that we have a shared value which is that workers are the most important thing and to fulfill the goal of lifting people out of poverty is one of the reasons I ran for council and it seems some some are very willing to dismiss that out of hand and they believe that I came here with a conservative agenda, which most people find laughable, but um, you're entitled to your opinion, I suppose. And the reality is that in speaking in the last three days to about a dozen businesses, um, it became very clear to me that nobody is going to roll this back. Nobody is going to lower a wage. Um, the practical nature of this is that um, people are being paid 1630. It is not, I would never vote to roll a wage back, um, although people have perceived my attempt at finding a nuance to allow both jobs and wages to, to succeed. Um, I would never vote to roll a wage back. And the reality is, you're right, Mr. Donahue, like, what is the least harm? Um, and it is important that we put people first, and I think people at this point um, deserve and expect the certainty that they uh, make $16.30, and that even if this were to go to the voter in um, March or November of next year, um, the practical nature is that no good business, at least, will roll wages back on those workers, nor should they, um, and that we do need to find ways to uh, Doug's point. We do not need to find ways to continue a dialogue, um, to find a path forward. Um, and a lot of people come up and say, find another way. Please bring that offer and that solution because it is not like I have sat up here without trying to find what those ways are. Um, and for those who feel that these are jobs that are um, not important or it's a bad business if they can't support their workers, sometimes that's true. Sometimes that is absolutely true. Um, but sometimes it's people who put in a lot of sweat and toil for 20 years to create a business to give opportunities to other people. And so it's for those people who I, I, hope, I, I hold out hope for, that they can still make it work and that the people they employ can remain employed. Because um, to me, this was about keeping jobs um, and not jobs that aren't worthy of, and not that the people aren't worthy of better pay or, um, a decent lifestyle, but how do we strike that balance? And I think it's, it is a more nuanced question. I, um, I appreciate everybody on both sides who has weighed in on it, um, even if I disagree with you. And um, I'm going to be supporting uh, rescinding this this evening. I think that's the right thing to do at this point. And my ask of my colleagues, I really appreciate Councilmember Martinez's comments about collegiality. Um, 
no matter what side of an issue you're on, trying to divide the five of us is the worst choice you can make. Um, because we respect each other even when we disagree. And um, I really appreciate that about my colleagues. And I want to give a special thanks to Mayor Medina, who joined me in having conversations over the past couple of weeks with so many stakeholders. Um, and although she and I did not share perspective on how to approach this issue, um, we respect one another and we both know that we're coming at this from uh, with similar goals and um, your partnership is just greatly appreciated. Thank you. That's all my comments. Um, I'd like to echo the sentiments of my, my fellow council members up here. I, I think one of the remarkable things is that we've gotten through the most fraught issue of our tenure up here together and we still have a collegial and professional relationship and we still know that we have shared values. And that's part of the reason that I am so happy to serve the city of Emeryville, because I think that's what they expect of us, and that's what they're getting, and that's a really fantastic thing. Um, I know that over the past few weeks, both myself and Member Bowders, um, and I'm sure my fellow council members as well, but I couldn't talk to them about it, um, have been meeting with workers, with business owners, with other stakeholder organizations, um, and trying to look at all sides of this. And even though Councilmember Bowders and I came at this initially from different perspectives, um, we've had long and intense conversations about this. And I, I truly believe, as a council, we want the same things. We want to support low-wage workers. We want to support everybody's ability to live in this very difficult economy in the Bay Area right now. And we're working uphill against larger economic factors than the 1.2 square miles of Emeryville. Um, I also know that we all want to keep jobs here in Emeryville. That's a priority for people to keep these jobs. We have paid sick leave and fair work week protections and a very high minimum wage, and we want to preserve these jobs and have people being able to be here in them. And yes, we also do want to keep small businesses, and local businesses thriving here in Emeryville. It's an important part of our community. Um, I, I've noticed that over the last month or so of this process, at first I was getting a lot of calls from small business owners, and those stopped, and that's had a chilling effect to me. I understand that um, they don't think that I'm listening or that I'm here for them because I've been such a strong advocate of a high minimum wage. And my commitment is that the conversation is not going to end here tonight. And I'm going to continue to meet with and work with our small business community and work to find solutions in the upcoming year to make sure that our small businesses can stay here and thrive and that we keep good jobs here in Emeryville. Um, so that's, that's my commitment tonight to the community and um, I will do everything in my power to, to make good on that. <laughs> Those are any of my comments. If there's any other discussion, I'm open to it. Otherwise, I'll take a motion. Madam Mayor, I'd like to move to approve resolution 12.1.1, which would rescind, nope. um, is that correct? Ordinance. No? The ordinance, read by title only. Oh, I'm sorry, I'll make a motion to read by title only. Second. We've got a motion from Member Batters, a second from Member Martinez. Please call the roll. Councilmember Bowders. Aye. Councilmember Donahue. Aye. Councilmember Martinez. Aye. Vice Mayor Pats. Aye. And Mayor Medina. Aye. Now I'd like to make a motion to approve resolution 12.1.1. Um, if I could read the title. Thank the you. title. Thank you. Uh, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Emeryville repealing ordinance number 19. Dash 007 regarding amendments to Chapter 37 of Title Thank 5 you. of the City of Emeryville Municipal Code, mi minimum wage, paid sick leave, and other employment standards with a CEQA uh. determination of exempt pursuant to state CEQA guidelines, sections 15324 and 15061 sub B3. Thank you. So before I make any motions, are there any other procedural things I should be aware of? No? Okay. I'd like to make a motion to approve. Um, Resolution 12.1.1. Ordinance? The ordinance? Yeah. To Not a resolution. It's an ordinance. Sorry. To approve the first reading? I will approve the first reading. I'll approve whatever you ask me to write. Second. How about that? <laughs> we got a motion from Member Outers. And I'd like to ask that with that motion, it can be separate, but the direction be given that, um, that the city form some form of a just a work group to discuss ways in which we can really try to help small businesses um, that want to do the right thing by workers, help them succeed here. Because I think it is a challenge to um, by small make, business, you mean. what's that? You said workers, but I think you meant small business. Yeah, small, small businesses, businesses and workers are, are often the same people. So I'm going to say workers and small business, and I mean that sincerely as the people who are impacted by the important policy changes that we have put in place to protect the public good. I think that we should 
have a, some form of an ad hoc group or whatever to continue that dialogue in partnership with all those stakeholders to understand what it is that they need and how we can best serve them. That's my motion. Second. We have a motion from Member Batters, a second from Member Martinez. Council Member Batters. Aye. Council Member Donahue. Aye. Council Member Martinez. Aye. Vice Mayor Patz. Aye. And Mayor Medina. Aye. Okay. Now we're going to move on to 12.4 because I agendized that. Here. We're sleeping here. Good evening. Aye. Good evening, Madam Mayor and Council. I'm Andrew Cloud, your Public Works Director. Item 12.4 is the consideration of Transportation Committee's recommendation for request for a loading zone at 1309 61st Street and an extension of the red zone on 65th Street south of Shell Mound Street. And staff recommends that the Council consider and approve the Transportation Committee's recommendation to add a 25-foot yellow loading zone centered at the driveway at 1309 61st Street and to extend the existing red zone on the west side of Shell Mound Street south of 65th Street by 20 feet. And I can explain in a little more detail if you'd like. Does anyone need further detail Council? on this? No, thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm going to open this up for public comment then. Is there any public comment on this item? Seeing none. Um, we'll move to discussion. I'm sorry, I had uh, moved this up because I assumed the applicant would be here. They came to Public Works and Transportation Committee. They had pictures, they had like a little sn slideshow. It's in a jam, they had a whole thing on it and I think it's a really good, totally valid request. And I'm gonna move to support it. <laughs> and the second one is an extension of a red curb for AC transit of an existing bus stop. Yes. yes, they're both good requests. So, I, I'd move approval. I'll second. Okay, we motion in a second. One sec. Council Member Bowders. Aye. Council Member Donahue. Aye. Council Member Martinez. Aye. Vice Mayor Pats. Aye. Mayor Medina. Aye. Okay, 12.2, back in order now. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. The City Council directed staff to select a new bank for banking services, and staff conducted a procurement process. Mechanics Bank meets the city's banking requirements, and they provide cash transit services through their partner, Loomis. During the selection process, the Budget and Governance Committee provided uh, guidance and recommendations uh, to the staff, and the committee recommended entering into contract with Mechanics Bank. The um, annual service charges are estimated at $17,000, including um, 13, uh, sorry, 12,000 for general banking services and 5,000 for uh, cash transit services. It will take about one to two months to implement all the products and services, including signing the legal documents and providing training to staff. Um, staff recommends that the city council approve um, the agreements uh, with Mechanics Bank and Loomis. Any clarifying questions? No, she's running away anyway. <gasps> <laughs> no, we don't have any, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, okay, any public comment on this item? All right, seeing none, any discussion on this item? I'll just um, remind council and for members of the public who don't know, the, the reason why we um, entered into looking into another provider for our banking services is because of Wells Fargo's involvement in funding the Dakota Access Pipeline. So um, uh, those, those of us on the Budget and Governance Committee thought that this um, uh, was reasonable uh, proposal from Mechanics Bank and although we're going to need the additional armored car services because we're, uh, <laughs> we're transporting large sums of money around um, and they're not right next door, um, that, that, that uh, additional expense was warranted in light of the benefits that we get. Okay. Any other discussion? Nope. Is there a motion? I'll move. I'll second. We got a motion from Member Bowders, a second from Vice Mayor Pats. Please call the roll. Council Member Bowders? Aye. Council Member Donahue? Aye. Council Member Martinez? Aye. Vice Mayor Pats? Aye. And Mayor Medina? Aye. Do we need two separate yeah, motions? Both? There are two resolutions. So I'll, I'll move the second resolution for the um, for Loomis Armored Services. I'll second that. 
Great. Motion by Member Martinez, second by Member Donahue. Council Member Bowders? Aye. Council Member Donahue? Aye. Council Member Martinez? Aye. Vice Mayor Paths? Aye. And Mayor Medina? Aye. Okay. Great. 12.3 Climate Action Plan Update. Hi. Uh, good evening, uh, Madam Mayor, members of Council. I am Nancy Humphrey. I am the uh, Environmental Programs Supervisor in Public Works. And I'm here to give you an update on our Climate Action Plan. Um, as you may recall, Emeryville actually ha was an early, um, an, a jurisdiction that was early in developing its first Climate Action Plan, which was in 2008. That Climate Action Plan called for a 25% reduction in GHGs, both at a community level and at a municipal level by 2020. Then uh, in 2016, we developed Climate Action Plan 2.0, and that one has targets for 2030 and 2050. So I'm gonna let you know kind of how, how we stand on those goals and what's happening. Um, sorry. Uh, the, inside the Climate Action Plan, we have a number of elements. We've got the reduction targets. We have a hazard vulnerability assessment that's related to climate change and um, both adaptation and resilience and mitigation. That's both three things, I understand. Um, for those potential changes. It's got a mitigation action plan and an adaptation action plan, and it has a vision for 2050, and it has a monitoring plan. It has a separate implementation plan, which is a living document. So we can list projects on there uh, that really opportunistically, as technology or money or opportunity arises, we, we can do that. One of the reasons we're doing it is the climate change is bringing a lot of uh, new risks to communities. And for us, one of the big ones, in addition to fire and heat and um, food scarcity and all of those, is flooding. So there's a, there's a website that was developed by BCDC and NOAA called Adapting to Rising Tides. And um, it, allows you to model different scenarios, different sea level rises and then storm conditions. And this is the scenario for 2050 with a moderate sea level rise predicted. This is a king tide, no storm surge. So you can see where there's overtopping is red. Um, we're still doing pretty well in terms of, you know, residential and business areas. The, the marsh is a different story. Um, but that's kind of almost a best case scenario. So we want to, we look now, that's 2100 with no high tide. This is no king tide, no storm surge. It's the same as the 2050 with king tide. So that's with a minimum projected sea level rise. But if we looked at a moderate, a medium projected sea level rise for 2100 with no high tide or storm surge, this is what it could look like. So we, like every other jurisdiction that is taking this seriously, are trying to do our part to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and to adapt, mitigate, and prepare our community and our infrastructure for potentials like this. Uh, all right, so our, the, our GHG, so GHGs are greenhouse gases and they're expressed in metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent gases. So MTCO2E, you'll see throughout this presentation. And that's because different gases are, are more potent in terms of the environment. Um, and so they're all normalized at carbon. So we, we say carbon, methane, for instance, is, is 25 times as uh, damaging, potentially. So we, we put those all in equivalent numbers. So we wanted a 25% reduction by 2020, 40 by 2030, and our vision is 80% by 2050 for both community as a whole and for municipal operations. So from the, for the community, we do our inventory every year. 
uh, thanks to interns and fellows who do most of that grunt work. So uh, thanks in absentia to those uh, interns who've been working on it. We've seen a total 15% decrease since 2004. So that's not our 25% um, goal, but our population has has grown vastly in that time. So I think it's important to look at a per capita measure as well. So from a per capita basis, you and uh, eliminating freeway traffic from the mix and just looking at local traffic impacts plus all the other measures, we've had a 45% de decrease per capita, which is pretty good. Um, there are a couple of main reasons for that, improved energy efficiency and efforts to, to improve energy efficiency, the increasing cleanliness of PG&E's electric grid. Um, to some extent, vehicles, they're not really getting that much better, but we are getting a more uh, substantial portion that are non-fossil fuel. And also our solid waste. We are doing really well in sorting and minimizing our waste streams and our landfill uh, has methane capture so we don't get charged with as much methane from that. But that's pretty good. I, uh, either way you count it, for on a per capita basis, we've, we're meeting the 2020 goal. But we have population growth and here's the thing, the thing about the my population numbers are they're residential only, doesn't even count the other economic increases, which have been great. You know, we're, we're bustling out there. That's not even in these numbers. If we were to continue to decrease at the impressive level we have been as a community, we would be on that red line, but we need to be on the green line. So it is not business as usual. <laughs> we can't do business as usual, and furthermore, we're we're getting the lowest hanging fruit first. So it's gonna get increasingly more difficult to make those strides. We, at the time of the Paris Accords, I think, uh, Council Member Donahue, you were the mayor then, I think, and we signed on to what was then the compact of mayors that then morphed into the global covenant of mayors. 600 cities worldwide belong to that. And we do biannual reporting on our strategy and our plans and our inventory. Only 43 cities, 7% of cities, re received an A grade from CDP for their work and Emeryville is one of those 7%. So, well done. Ooh. Yeah. So that's on the community side. So we also have the goals for the municipal and the municipal, we have a little more control. We, we control our own behavior much more than we control the public's behavior. So in 2017, and it's important that it's 2017, and I'll talk about 2019 in a minute, we have had a 33.4% reduction since 2010, and a 41% reduction since 2004 on comparable data. We don't have all the same data for 2004 that we have, so i just give you those two numbers. Again, very good. Um, this is where the, contributions are coming from, um, the, the greener green, the, the lighter green is uh, 2004 and the bluer green is 2017. You can see one of the biggest projects was the street light retrofit. That one got us 25% uh, savings just by itself. We're going, we're going in the right direction in everything except for employee commute. Employee commute has gone up and um, we could speculate why I think people are m living further away, maybe. Um, so that's something we can attack. We can attack buildings and facilities and we can attack vehicle fleet. Those are things we can work on going forward. This is busy and I'm actually gonna visit, revisit it in a busier slide later. So, but what I wanted to get to here is that, um, oh, what I want to say about 2019 is, in 2018, we opted for greenhouse gas free electricity for city uses. So that portion of our building of facilities will just drop right out. So I'll show you about that uh, later. 
One of the things, and you may be hearing about, so this list we'll go over, electrification of building energy systems. You've, you've been hearing about this. Berkeley just uh, took some action on natural gas in future new construction. Um, it is the talk of the town, sustainability circles, is getting greenhouse gas free, preferably local renewable energy, uh, electrical energy, and getting out of natural gas. That's a, you can never get the carbon equivalent out of natural gas. It's always there. Um, so I'll revisit this list, but first uh, my, I want to introduce Edgar Barassa. Some of you have met him. He has been our Civic Spark Fellow this year since last September. And uh, he's our third Civic Spark Fellow. We had Hoi Fei Mok, we had Fanny Yang, and now we've had Edgar. And Edgar just came back from Sacramento where he was chosen statewide to, to represent the Civic, Civic Spark Fellows at their graduation with a speech. Um, Civic Spark is an AmeriCorps program that the Governor's Office of Policy and Research, Planning and Research, um, has focused on expanding climate capacity in local government. So um, Edgar is here, and I am very pleased to say that he, he's ending, well, I'm not pleased to say he's ending his fellowship with us at the end of next week, as scheduled, but that he has already taken a job as a, an environmental justice associate with the SFPUC going forward. In addition to, so he did uh, two main projects while he was here. He did a lot of other things. Main projects were giving us a roadmap for electrification for municipal activities, especially buildings, and that's what he's going to talk about today. He also worked on uh, developing and beefing up our capacity to integrate equity into all of our uh, functions. So uh, I'll hand it over to Edgar for a few slides and, and he'll tell you about his project. Okay, uh, good evening, Council and Mayor. Um, that microphone is Oh, I'm sorry. Good evening, Council and Mayor. Yeah. So, let's see. So, uh, my slides, the main project was to find methods to decarbonize Emory Wheels municipal buildings um, through electrification. So, decarbonization and electrification are pretty big terms, really confusing at first. It took me a while to grapple around them, but we'll be going a little bit in depth um, forward. So, essentially, what electrification is, is essentially um, fuel switching from mixed fuel energies to only electricity. And so the reason why that's a high valued impact is because we can decarbonize electricity. We can decarbonize it by sourcing um, solar, um, hydropower, and wind into using that as a main source. But for natural gas on the other side, it's really impossible. It's made, mostly made up of methane, which is about 25%, uh, 25 times um, more potent than uh, regular carbon on its own. Um, and so there's a, a variety of benefits and why we should do this or what we should look into this. Um, so there's public benefits which can eliminate indoor um, air pollution from natural gas. Um, it can eliminate, um, frac uh, help reduce fracking, which essentially kind of um, pollutes our underground water resources too. And another um, way to, another social public benefit from this is that it can reduce the amount of uh, potential of Natural gas, natural gas pipeline um, ruptures um, that could potentially happen from earthquakes or any other type of event. That's something that is, um, it essentially is dangerous and re uh, through electrification we can reduce mm -hmm. those uh, potential risks. So, and looking at the inventory, these are greenhouse gas emissions per specific building. <coughs> So in 2018, uh, we essentially switched to uh, opt into EBCE's Bright Choice, and so the only remaining um, emissions came from natural gas sources or in mixed fuel technologies, um, which City Hall right now has the highest source of emissions, about 129 metric tons um, annually. And so in finding ways to reduce all those emissions, we came up with the five-step plan and of t different various technologies that can help us achieve those um, reductions to zero. So this um, five-step plan incorporates um, uh, decarbonizing our electricity, um, looking into energy efficiency technologies, looking into solar, um, and then looking into battery storage opportunities and essentially fuel switching at the end. So the dark blue represents of the uh, 
essentially what we have already accomplished. So we already decarbonized electricity and we have already um, implemented and installed energy efficiency opportunities for the city hall. Um, the medium blue represents the things that we are currently looking at right now, um, which are looking into energy efficiency upgrades for the rest of the municipal um, buildings, such as fire station 34, 35, PD, and ECDC. Um, as well as for solar too, we've been very, um, on top of that, I have installed solar on our quite a few of our buildings, and so the future would be looking into various um, battery storage opportunities and finally fuel switching. And going through all those steps and plans, we could have uh, essentially reduced the 238 metric tons of CO2 um, emissions. And so in kind of modeling that, um, how this looks like in the energy load, um, I use the city's hall as a kind of like a case study such as um, of how we can do that because you're essentially almost there and electrifying that building. Um, so in 2003, I took this, um, well, all this data is actually from our PG&E uh, um, data inventory. So in 2003, before we did anything to it, um, through the month of August through September, the energy load was about 39,000 um, kWh. Um, and then after installing solar, we were able to reduce that significantly um, to 24,000 kWh. And then with the installing um, energy efficiency opportunities with the solar, we were able to also reduce that um, energy load. And so the reason why this is important because this can help us um, make our buildings be ready to essentially um, fully electrify to using all electric HVAC systems. Is that a question, Edgar? So does that, um, the light blue represent our total load or just what we're drawing off the grid? Um, that is the total load from the, um, the city hall. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. It's from the grid, though. Yeah, it's, yeah from the grid. But, it, but so it, uh, for the 2016 energy efficient plus solar, are we mm. subtracting the solar that we're no, uh, that includes it into it. Uh, it just as um, we're subtracting the energy load um, through the energy efficiency opportunity. So we are able to reduce the amount of energy we use. Yes. Um, yeah. So I'm just wondering if, if the solar is subtracted from that blue, that light blue bar. The, the solar. solar the, the opportunity of, so the, the solar that we're, we're getting, yeah. is that? Uh, that is that? Right. So what, yeah, excuse me. Yeah, sorry. Um, yes, yeah, so the, both 2006 and 2016 reflect the uh, amount we don't pull off the grid because of our solar. So the solar is included in that number as a negative. Okay, that's what I meant. Yeah, thank you. Sorry for the uh, and clarification. I didn't know how to ask the question. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so essentially um, the city hall is essentially, uh, the energy load is ready to fully electrify um, because you're able to reduce the energy load so significantly with solar and energy efficiency opportunities. Um, so yeah. And so th doing this work seems very uh, complicated. There's a, um, it can be cost a lot of money and there's so many barriers into doing this work. Um, so we've been looking into and researching different opportunities and resources that can help us um, do this work. Um, so one of the future opportunities, um, th this plan right now from the CPC, it's very um, hazy, very fuzzy right now. It's still in the works right now, so I'm not going to try to fully explain it because it's not fully there yet, but essentially it is very um, important because this can essentially uplift the barriers and providing future incentives to fully electrify our buildings by allowing um, part of that money be used to installing HVAC systems that are all electric. So um, how it's been uh, implemented, this uh, program is still really fuzzy yet, but essentially a big opportunity that we should be keeping an eye into that can essentially fully help us out. Um, uh, another strategy to help um, install solar for our other buildings that haven't been installed yet is to look into a power purchase agreement. So essentially a power purchase agreement is essentially where um, a client, which would essentially maybe be us, um, works with the, a vendor or a third party um, organization that essentially takes up the upfront cost of the capital of installing solar and essentially the client, which would be us, only pay for the electricity. Um, and so that could essentially mean um, there, uh, be an 800, I, I'm giving a, a random number of uh, a solar project being very costly to being ex essentially no cost and only paying for the electricity. Um, so that's a really um, difficult to kind of put together, but essentially is a big um, strategy in how to install solar. Um, 
Right now, also, um, through a pg e pro program, there is a battery storage incentives that can help us install battery storage for our municipal buildings um, and can help us uh, achieve a portion of resiliency, too, for our buildings. Um, it can be really useful for our critical buildings that we deem critical for our communities for any type of event. Um, and right now, um, BACMED has a climate protection grant. Um, it's currently not in... Um, uh, in cycle right now, it's going. Uh, there's a potential for it to be renewed, but essentially, you can pro be, um, provide almost three hundred thousand dollars in grants to allow cities to get that fund and to essentially install um, uh, technologies that help us reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, which can potentially be used for an HVAC system or any other technologies we see fit um, per building. Um, and essentially, uh, yeah, that's kind of it of the, and so. As a whole, um, the Bay Area is moving towards electrification. Um, different cities are taking different opportunities and strategies in how to electrify um, their community and also their municipalities. Um, so the city of Fremont has developed and created a carbon neutral goal and post-carbon framework, which essentially reaches carbon neutrality um, and looks into a future of uh, uh, essentially sequestering carbon. Um, the city of Hayward also developed a zero net energy goal too, um, and cities of San Jose and others are actually adopting reach codes to fully electrify their buildings and their transportation system. And the city of Palo Alto, I just got notified that they're also looking into uh, developing a roadmap and plan of how to electrify their buildings, which is something that they're looking into as well. And the, what's hot off the press is Berkeley is looking into, well, actually just ban natural gas in the new construction buildings. So as a whole, this. Um, the cities are looking into this opportunity to reach their um, their climate action plan goals, but it's also electrification uh, as a statewide version is going to be something very important California will be looking into to meet its own carbon neutrality goals. <coughs> and that is it. I'll pass it back to Nancy. Anybody have any questions for Andrew? I have, I have two questions. Yes. Um, the first on the back mid grants mm -hmm. uh, for electrification technology, mm -hmm. um, how much money is uh, available to a city for those grants? Yeah, so f um, generally it's about $300,000, but if a city submits a letter for um, a request for more, potentially that can be done. Mm -hmm. um, we can essentially raise that grant up to 400000 maybe 500000 I'm not too sure, but that could potentially be used as a good way to pay a big chunk of a uh, technology that we look fit that might best be fit for a, bu a building. You said the grant cycle is not open now, but is it on a regular standard cycle or is it only when money is available? And if that's the case, when do we think it will open? Yeah, so um, it's still a little bit uncertain whether it's going to be um, uh, re um, replenished again, but what I've heard uh, from other back employees that it potentially will be. So we just have to keep an eye on when it opens again and just be on top of that too. Um, so just looking at to when this potential grant opens up, that's something that we should be keeping an eye on. Okay, my other question will be for staff, which is um, solar panels were listed as something being studied for the future at ECDC, and I just wanted to ask if that's going to be coordinated at all with the new roof. He had that down in the light blue, you know, as the, the future, but no, not as part of the roof currently. Do we know what it would cost to put solar panels at ECDC? I don't have an estimate for that right now. Okay. Any other clarifying questions? Yes. Uh, I just want to thank Edgar for being on the sustainability committee with and helping us and our city with these issues. Thank you very much. Thank you, council member. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. It's been a delight to work with you on sustainability, and congratulations on your new role at the PUC. Congrats. I hope you'll come yeah. back and visit us. Thank you. Thank you, Council Members and Mayor. Okay. So um, that is <clears throat> just one potential way for that we could, or we should be taking many roads, right? So um, here's that busy slide again. USDN is the Urban Sustainability Directors Network. It's a group to which we belong. Uh, there are two, roughly 200 cities, mostly in North America, some in Europe, who belong, and it's a peer network. It's a really, really valuable peer network. So one of the, they fund studies, they funded a study that we did, uh, they gave us a grant a couple years ago, but one study that was done last year was which practices get the real uh, high impact. Where is your best bang for your dollar? 
and they came up with these 14 high impact practices. And um, so we are actually working on many of these already. Some of them the time is not right for, some of them we're looking at, but uh, I, when this list came out and I looked at it from this lens, I was pretty, uh, pretty pleased that it seemed like we were, we were not wasting time on, on things that were not important. And um, I'll point out, as I did before, our, our waste management specifically has, is, is very good. We have the highest diversion rate in Alameda County for our, for our waste, you know, separating it at the customer level. So how do we get to an 80% reduction or, you know, maintain and keep going toward a 40% reduction for 2030? We continue our efforts in infrastructure, including our bike ped infrastructure, um, trying to reduce our traffic load. Traffic is a big part of our traffic and commercial energy are, are two biggies in the community. So we're working on both of those things, um, and we should continue to. We want to monitor and update, we want to continue to monitor and update the implementation plan, and um, some potential high impact activities are switching the fleet, uh, or parts of the fleet to EVs or hybrids, implementing expanded parking disincentives citywide because we have uh, a disproportionate number of cars that come in every day with uh, employees. Um, Institute re potentially reach codes and incentives for greenhouse gas free energy or uh, energy resilience with a sort of a, a mini microgrid uh, on buildings or um, potentially for phasing out natural gas, different things that we might be able to do on a policy level. Business as usual won't get us there, but um, we're good at thinking creatively. So I have, I'm hopeful. And that's that. Any questions for me? Nope. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any public comment on this item? All right. Oh, there we go. Hmm? Okay, so, um, I'm reminded of Measure C, should we build the center of community life? <clears throat> the, and the city council recommended the voters do vote for that. And one of the bond issue, uh, the uh, things that are $95 million bonds paid for were solar cells on the roof at uh, ECCL. Well, we, we went ahead and sold the $95 million worth of bonds and we never got the solar cells, the solar, the, uh, solar electric on the roof of the ECCL. So, I mean, so now it's, it's suddenly now <coughs> a big problem because we're not going to be able to reach our climate goals. Uh, so I think it's incumbent upon you to like f get this stuff on the solar cells on the roof that we paid for um, at ECCL. Also at ECCL there was... Um, Oh, there was another problem. Let me see. I've already forgotten. I lost my train of thought. Uh, okay, it's incumbent upon you to uh, say no to the ANI project as it's being proposed by the ANI developer for ecological reasons, for climate, uh, uh, for carbon and, uh, reasons in the atmosphere. Yeah, I mean, that project is, an, is a nightmare for, from a climate perspective. And uh, so I, I know you're not, you guys haven't been, you've expressed interest that you're not fond of regulating the ANI developer. As a matter of fact, you've sort of like jumped over yourselves to roll back regulations for that developer. But here's a case where you're going to have to put more regulations in front of him and you're gonna have to tell him that you can't build it the way you're, you're planning on building it because it's too, uh, it's got too big of a carbon footprint. And so, I, I mean, I, I'm not, I don't know if you have the wherewithal to do that. It seems like you're, you're not, um, wound that way. It seems like you want, want to just please the Omni developer, but uh, it would do, go a long ways to showing your goodwill that to, uh, in that regard if you would go back and give us our solar cells that we paid for on the uh, ECCL roof. Thank you. Any other public comment on this item? 
Okay, seeing none, I'll open it up for discussion. Member Martinez. So, um, Nancy mentioned that the city went ahead and upgraded our um, basic uh, energy to a uh, carbon-free product, which I just wanted to let people who are watching know that anyone in Emeryville can do the same by going to um, ebce.org and um, you can upgrade your regular electricity product to a carbon-free product or you can go a step further and get a hundred percent renewable product um, and that's a way that you can make a difference at home um, another thing that you could do and uh, nancy also mentioned that uh, a big way to make an impact and the way that um, people in alameda county have been making an impact is by um, recycling properly and the biggest um, area to do this is by pulling organics out of the waste stream and organics are things um, like your leftover food that decomposes in the trash and that actually creates met methane or methane uh, yeah, I hear it just said differently I like to say methane um, that creates methane which um, as Nancy mentioned is a short-term pollutant but it's 20 times more potent and damaging than carbon um, so it's really, really important uh, that we are not throwing food into landfill. Uh, and um, the way that we can get around that is if you don't already have one, you can contact Marcy Greenhut here at City Hall and ask for your compost bin, which you can then dump out into your green bin. Um, everyone uh, who is uh, getting serviced by waste management should have a green bin because it's going to cost you less than sending things to landfill if you separ separate properly. And while you're at it, um, put all your rigid plastics and milk cartons into the recycling bin. Thank you. That is, thank you for coming to my TED talk. <laughs> yeah, I know that the single biggest composter in the city of Emeryville is Diane Martinez. <laughs> there is no question. I just touched the most compost. <laughs> it's, it's a real fact. Any other comments on this item? Well, yes. I, I'd just like to say that uh, electrification of re residences is really happening in uh, a, a big way. And I've seen on a recent tour that the League of Women Voters had sponsored by, uh, I guess it was 350.org, eight homes that have been electrified and made into net zero or net positive homes. And uh, it's the, the world of energy use is not that difficult to get it down to zero and make additional power so that we can charge our future vehicles. And the uh, Bay Area is ideally situated in our climate so that we can do this. And uh, I, I think we should really have an interest in doing this because uh, it's inevitable we're going to have to do it, and the sooner we get started, the better. Um, I'd like to note that we took another step towards our climate goals tonight on our consent agenda. Uh, we passed an ordinance, uh, we passed Green Mondays, uh, which means that on Mondays or one day a week, the city of Emeryville will only be providing plant-based meals here at council and be providing plant-based meals um, with a milk alternative as mandated by state law only um, for all of our city programs. Um, the food that you consume is the third largest driver of climate change across all sectors. Um, this is a small but really important step of shifting our city's behaviors towards our climate action goals. And it's something we didn't talk about because it was on consent. We talked a lot about it at sustainability committee. It's something I'm proud that we're moving forward as a city and recognizing. Any other comments? Okay, next up. We don't need a motion, that's just information, right? Okay. Thanks for all the information, bye Edgar. Bye Edgar, thank bye, you. Bye Edgar, thank you, congratulations. I miss him. All right, 12.5, ooh. Designation of voting delegate and alternates to League of California Cities annual conference. I just wanna say, I hope you vote for me because I already bought my plane ticket. <laughs> In case we're playing nose goes, I was ready. <laughs> Um, do we need to have a presentation on this? I don't oh, think for so. Public comment. <laughs> public comment on this item? No. I move we send Diane. Oh, let's. Uh, I second. <laughs> First class. <laughs> Please call the roll. Councilmember Bowders. Aye. Councilmember Donahue. Aye. Councilmember Martinez. Aye. 
Vice Mayor Paths. Aye. And Mayor Medina. Aye. Okay. Wish you the best of luck. <laughs> Enjoy beautiful Long Beach. Long Beach, California. Woo. Long Beach isn't the issue. It's called <laughs> League of California yes, yes. Cities Annual Conference, which to me <laughs> sounds like punishment over a weekend. But I've done my time. <laughs> Thank you for picking up. Um, department head reports. Crickets. Wow. Crickets. Scott's next sustainable meal source. Uh, sorry. Future agenda item request from council members. Yes, I've got one. Um, I hope council will agree to uh, take to consider a change to our cannabis delivery hours to bring our local regulations in line with state regulations. Um, currently, our delivery hours end at 8 p.m. and the state regulations um, end at 10 p.m. That's also when our dispensaries close. So. Support. Absolutely. No, yes, sure, yeah. Three, you've yeah. got three. Cool. You've got five. I have one. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to ask that we have a discussion at the second meeting in September, staff being uh, capable of providing it by then. Um, just high level discussion at the council about um, consideration of the prohibition of facial recognition technology mm. by city employees. I would like to um, ban the use of that. It's a dangerous practice that needs to be controlled early on by local governments. So if there's support for that, I'd like to take that on. Yeah. Sure, we Should can agendize yeah. that. So we can, we can agendize the item and then get some direction from the council yes. about where you want to go. Thank you. But that would be the second meeting in September? Please. Any other agenda requests? I don't know. We're brainstorming now. <laughs> um, I have a, a couple of things or a few things. Um, one thing that sitting on my subcommittees has come up is a lot of issues around grants and all the different processes. And so what I'm looking for here is I'd love to spend some time and look at all the disparate grants programs we have. And what I'm finding is there's some overlap. And so this might be something for October, but bring it back and we really look at them holistically. And particularly now as we've talked a little bit this evening about what we're gonna do for small businesses, this comes from EDACT, it comes from community services. I'd really love to see sort of how we tie them all in together, um, where there's overlap and where we are prioritizing with that. So that was my first request. Support? Yes. Yep. Great. Um, Council Member, uh, Vice Mayor, could I request that before we schedule that for a date certain, you and I sit down and talk about the sc how we scope that? Yeah, I'd hope to talk to you before tonight, but oh, I just fine. ran out of an option. But yeah, happy to. Thank you. Um, the other thing, and this is again, no dates attached to these, but I would love to have an update on how our scooter ordinance is performing. I've had a couple of people ask me, and there's been some changes, so I'd love to get a sense of where we are in that process. Sort of a report out. Right, there's nothing to schedule right now because it hasn't been fully implemented yet. Okay. So when we do that, we can bring an information report once we launch it. I still haven't launched, okay. That was a good update then. All right, um, and then finally, I want to take a look at, and I've talked to member Bowders about this, uh, looking at some recognitions in the city and some things that we do. One of the things that's happening is, uh, an example of this is the Savage site that may or may not continue with that name. So I'd like to sort of talk with him in a subcommittee about what we can do. And we've talked about this offline, I'm seeing some nods. So if that's okay, we'd like to form a subcommittee, talk about, um, how we recognize people in that at that level. Yes, of course. If you want to build a giant statue of me, you're more than welcome to. Yes. You're saying yes to Christian's thing or Allie's thing? <laughs> you, you guys can so I have to clarify it was an animatronic <laughs> to greet people at the front. Does that count? It's so creepy. Please discuss whatever you're gonna discuss in your ad hoc without I want to be clear of my ask. Make I'm making notes of what you just wanted here, so yeah, so support. for just to clarify, Madam Mayor, then so we, what we would schedule for a September meeting then is an item to create an ad hoc subcommittee to d to discuss policies for uh, recognition. Yes. sure. But not facial recognition. <laughs> oh. you know, it's funny that you have that on here because I have written <laughs> them next to each other. And it's, I noticed that too. Anything else? That's it. Well, you're on a roll. I would like us to consider making some kind of ordinance about new residential construction being either net zero or fully electric. 
Just residential, uh, not commercial? Well, uh, the, the commercial is complex. I think we could start with residential. I had just emailed you today about San Francisco because I thought maybe we could bring this to sustainability first. Would that be okay? Yes. Okay. I support. Support. Okay. Mayor Medina? Yeah. A couple of things on upcoming study sessions. Mm. Um, we have a couple of study sessions uh, that we need to have with you on re uh, amendments to the planning regulations. One is the continued study session on high-rise development uh, unit mix regulations, uh, which we tentatively have scheduled for your next meeting on September 3rd. And then another is on the uh, elimination of the minimum parking requirement. I have heard that Councilmember Bowders may be participating remotely on September 3rd. Yeah, I was going to ask um, for those items if the council was supportive, if we could move the planning items to a time where I could be personally present to hear the public. It would just be easier. We were going to make that request. That That's uh, what we were planning to do because we thought it would actually be easier for staff if the full council could be present. Yes. C can I just add oh. one item to that? I support what you're, uh, you're, you're suggesting. Can we add the bird safe building design into this? Well, that hasn't gone to the planning commission yet. Uh, so, I thought it was going this summer, no? Yeah, but well. We have minimum parking standards going this week. Correct. So what we'd like to, to get some guidance on tonight is, do you, do you wanna do the minimum parking standards in September and the unit mix in October, or what, what's your preference in terms of the order of those? We have uh, October 1st is uh, the other slot, so we've got or the 15th but we've it, assuming we don't do any on September 3rd then it would be September 17th October 1st October 15th I would say we do parking on September 17th everyone's amenable to that I think yes. parking was the first one I asked for so I think that's the most important one to do I think birds are technically first I think the unit mix thing was actually predated that but oh. I want to talk about parking first. Parking is, okay. parking is the number one thing. Okay. All right. Sorry to throw in, I'm going to be gone on October 15th. Okay. So September do, 17th, uh, you can do parking. Okay. And then October 1st, the unit mix? Sure. Okay. Okay. I would just let you know we've just about wrapped up our study with Kaiser Marston on the economics of the unit mix. So we can do that on October 1st and the parking on September 17th. And okay. yeah, and then just to clarify, the bird safe design is going when? Uh, t da, da, da. I think it's tentatively going to the planning commission in s September. Let me. Um, sorry. Uh, all right, one second. Sure. Um, birds, birds, birds. Yes, yeah, September 26th. To so, okay, so possibly in November we could talk about that here. Uh -huh. Okay. okay. Thank that, you. Does that wrap up our agenda planning sesh? Yes, thank you. Okay. All right, this meeting is adjourned. Nine to five.